From training to performing, join our Big League Conversation. Welcome to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast with your host, Eric Cressy. Welcome back to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Cressy, and this is episode 48. Today's guest is a Cressy sports performance athlete who made his major league debut last year and had some instant success. As you'll realize from today's podcast, uh, it was not by accident. He's a guy who has a really good plan and lots of lessons to share, so we're in for a really good episode. Today's episode is brought to you by Mark Pro. If you're a baseball pitcher, you know that keeping your arm healthy is essential. But with high training volumes on top of games, that's not always easy. Overuse is a significant problem for players at every level of baseball right now. Certainly, we see shoulder and elbow injuries as some of the most common overuse injuries in baseball. And as an example, at the professional level, a UCL injury can result in an average of 17.2 months out of competition. That's a huge deal also if you're a young player and you miss out on a lot of development. So really, at the end of the day, there are three ways that we can combat overuse. First, you can reduce the workload, and certainly there's been a lot of research out there on pitch counts. Second, and this is the theme of these podcasts, is that you can build a significant level of strength and fitness to prepare yourself. However, a third key approach that's often overlooked is that you can work to improve your recovery so that you can safely display your fitness day in and day out. And that's really where the Mark Pro is an effective tool. Some athletes will even use it to warm up their arms before they throw as well. Mark Pro is a cutting edge EMS device that uses patented technology to create non fatiguing muscle activation. And this is what separates it from other recovery tools. Muscle activation with Mark Pro facilitates each stage of the body's natural recovery process, similar to active recovery, but without the extra muscular effort and fatigue. Athletes can use it for as long as they need to ensure a more full and quick recovery in between training or games. With its portability and ease of use, players can use Mark Pro while traveling between games or while relaxing at home. We have players that use it all the time on team flights to bounce back while they're just chilling on that flight. Um, we have plenty of pro guys that use this. In fact, every ML team and over 200 pro pitchers are regularly using Mark Pro. Um, put it to the test for yourself now with their new Try Before You Buy program. And you can use the promo code Cressy at checkout for 10% off at markpro.com. Again, that's Cressy, C-R-E-S-S-E-Y, at checkout for 10% off at markpro.com, M-A-R-C-P-R-O.com. Today's guest played high school baseball in Connecticut and moved on to Northeastern University for his college career. After being named a Cape Cod League All-Star in the summer after his sophomore year, he went 9-3 with a 1.73 ERA his junior year at Northeastern. He earned Colonial Athletic Association Pitcher of the Year honors and was then selected by the Cleveland Indians in the third round of the 2016 MLB Draft. He made his Major League debut on June 22, 2019 and went six shutout innings with six strikeouts to beat the Detroit Tigers for his first Major League win. He then went on to become only the 10th Major League pitcher in history to toss at least five and two-thirds innings and allow two runs or fewer in each of his first six appearances as a starter. Please welcome to the show, Aaron Savale. Welcome to the show, Aaron. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm uh, I'm very excited for this because we've worked together for a couple of years, but I feel like I haven't had as much of a chance to dig in on kind of like your history and your development over the years. Um, and one of the things that always intrigues me about uh, pitchers from the Northeast is they tend to be late bloomers. Like you often see guys that you know are 86 to 88 out of high school and they go to college and things really click for them. But let's talk about Aaron as a high school player. What what made you a Division One pitcher? but maybe not necessarily a pro prospect out of high school. Yeah, I mean, you pretty much nailed it on the head exactly what I was in high school. Um, probably 85 to 88, um, two-pitch guy, pretty much just fastball, curveball. Um, actually couldn't really throw a changeup, so I messed around with a knuckleball my senior year. But uh, that's a conversation for a different day. <laughs> um, but I don't know, I just kind of probably what separated me was more how I went about the game itself um, from mental and just competitive standpoint, um, regardless of what I had, I, I attacked with it and mm -hmm. it was Connecticut high school baseball, but yeah. baseball in high school was baseball. And at the end of the day, it was just uh, going out there and trying to compete and get the job done. 
was it a big change for you, like making the adjustment from, from high school to college, or did that mentality kind of just allow you to hit the ground running when you got to Northeastern? I think a lot of the baseball aspect of it was same mentally. Um, but coming out of high school, I don't, I maybe touched weights twice. Um, so that first month in, of college, September of 2013, mm-hmm. pretty much trying to learn how to and what to do in a weight room. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, that definitely helped tremendously down the road, obviously. Uh, but yeah, just getting used to all of that, all of the, the arm care stuff and all the non baseball things that go into being a pitcher and being a baseball player. Yeah. Would you say that lifting was like the biggest adjustment as you went to college or was there a lot that changed in the way that you, you know, focused mechanically or pitch mix wise, like, um, you know, to, to, you know, thrive over the course of those three years? Yeah. So pitch mix wise, I think my, my first two years of college, I was a reliever. So didn't really have the need to throw the five, six pitches that I throw right now Mm -hmm. and didn't have them. Like I said, I was two pitch guy at a high school. So Mm -hmm. I kind of realized that my fastball at the time that I threw in high school naturally cut. Once I figured that out, I turned it into a cutter intentionally. And I also started throwing a two seam. So I changed my mix from just four seam curveball to two seam cutter curveball. Mm-hmm. Um, and at some point during my freshman year, I was, I think I was one, two on a guy and it was, one of the best hitters in our our league at the time was William and Mary. I think his name was Alex Katz. Mm-hmm. Not sure on his first name. I know his last name was Katz. <laughs> um, and I I just needed to get an out at the time, and I tried to make my cutter a little bigger, and that kind of turned into a slider. Pretty much an an accidental thing when it happened at the time, but came in and was asked like, "Did you do that on purpose? You throw a slider there?" I was like, "I just tried to make I just tried to make the cutter a little bigger and." Coach Cobb, still there, pitching coach at Northeastern. Uh, mm-hmm. It's like, oh, you're just going to keep throwing that. So, <laughs> so I, that's a big deal. I mean, that's two breaking balls out of the same tunnel, which most guys work on for years, and you you discovered it accidentally with one pitch. <laughs> yeah. So for a while, it, it worked. I got away with it for a while, um, but eventually, I'll get to it later. But my, eventually, those three pitches started to blend together, and I. Yeah. I threw all three, but I also threw pretty much everything in between from 89 cutter all the way to 75 curveball and every pitch in between and wasn't always consistent with all of those. Um, but that was something that refined over years and still refining, but we'll, we'll get to that later. I'm curious when you, when you talked about the, um, like the natural cut to your four seam, was that something that folks had tried to coach you out of? Was it like a, you know, you know, like Tristan McKenzie, you obviously know Tristan. Well, Tristan's got a natural cut to a four seam that's, you know, really, really impressive and it gets on guys and surprises them. Kenley Jansen's obviously a guy like that as well. Was that something yeah. that you were constantly trying to fix or did you just roll with it because it worked? Um, so I, in high school, I didn't really have any instruction. I never, growing up, I never had any pitching instruction. It was just kind of found my arm slot and ran with that. Uh, having said that, I think my arm slot is conducive of a little bit of cut. Mm-hmm. Um, some that may call it a flaw in delivery. I tend to get out of my core a little bit, but as long as I can control that, that lets me cut the ball the way I do. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's ever, I, it was definitely a thought, um, to try and straighten out the four seam, but at the expense of losing the cutter, which is now my bread and butter. I know my, my instructs here at the Indians, my first year, uh, Ruben had me talk to, uh, John, a blank on his name. <laughs> um, but I had me talk to one of the guys in the big leagues at the time. And just like, if you, uh, if you have a cutter, like don't try and get rid of, don't try and get rid of that movement. Like mm-hmm. take that movement and run with it. Um, You'd, why would you try and get rid of something that's going to be can do like help you get hitters out? Don't don't run away from that. I'm I'm always intrigued. I'm, I'm jumping forward a little bit, but I'm always intrigued about guys who have smooth transitions from college to pro ball, um, or you know, high school to pro ball certainly. But you know, there's an adjustment from a seven day rotation to a five day rotation. You see a lot of guys who just they don't understand how to recover. You know, they don't understand how to, you know, modulate bullpen intensity so that they're not dragging by the time the, the start rolls around. 
Um, you know, was it a big adjustment for you? Because the numbers certainly say otherwise. It seems like you, you jumped right into pro ball and did well right away. But did you have a hard time making that switch? I think initially in short season, no. Uh, just because the Indians were good about it. I came out of college after 15 starts and 114 innings. Mm-hmm. Um, they were limited in me. Probably the first five starts were two inning starts. And then the next eight or so, I think I had 13 starts total and only 52 innings. So they limited us to mm-hmm. two and then three innings per start. Um, just kind of get us used to that five day. We did all the work that you would do if you're throwing a full game, but yep. trying to figure everything out, when to do shoulder programs, when to throw bullpens and that all is still a work in progress. Um, <laughs> but I think I have a much better handle on it now than I did back in 2016. And, uh, just to touch on conversation right before this was Brian Shaw that I had talked to. Um, oh, there you go. Pretty good. I know there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot of Shaws that get confusing. So I wanted to make sure I get the first name, right? <laughs> oh, there you go. But I mean, you know, what I think is really, really intriguing, like 2017. So you got and you, you throw 164 innings, 141 strikeouts and 14 walks. So that's, that's less than a walk per start. It may be a walk every, uh, actually it was 27 starts and 14 walks. So you, you walked uh, basically a half a batter per outing. Um, do you think that there's, there, uh, is that a dying breed in baseball right now? People that actually want to throw a ton of strikes? Like, is that, is that changing or what, what was your mindset back in 2017 as you did that? You know, it's interesting. I know a lot of guys, like right now is strikeouts and home runs. That's what's, yeah. that's what's desired in baseball. Um, and I think you can still get strikeouts without sacrificing the strike zone. It's just being mm-hmm. smart about where you're throwing those pitches. Um, really just comes down to confidence in your pitches and attacking with them a mindset that I've had for a few years. And I know other people have shared this that pitchers should approach this in this way. Just a couple weeks ago, I was on a panel and it was, uh, led by, um, sorry, I'm really bad with names. I don't know why <laughs> this is. Um, but anyway, the mindset is, I'm on the mound. I'm not on defense. I'm on offense. The, yeah. the hitter should be on defense. Um, but just being on offense on the mound and going after them is, is my mindset. So why, why would I be shy about throwing strikes and trusting my pitches? Absolutely. I remember a conversation I had with Lance Lynn and, you know, Lance, he, he's toned his fastball usage down over the years, but there was a time when he was throwing like 75% fastballs and, Granted, Lance has like four different fastballs, but I remember him just saying, you know, <laughs> just, just throw fastball these guys. Hitters aren't that good. Um, you, you have the odds in your favor. Is that how you've always approached it? Um, I don't do that with my fastball and I have seen him do that last yeah. year against us. He, I'm pretty sure he threw 26 straight fastballs to start <laughs> the game. And I'm pretty sure he, if it wasn't one, two, three, he got through the first two or three innings pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, Eventually, somebody touched the ball and he had to change his approach, but <laughs> it was pretty impressive to see what he was doing. Um, but yeah, I've always, I've always been a guy that mixes. Um, I've, I was a reliever for two years, like I mentioned, and yeah. I've kind of always pitched that way. I've just extended it into six, seven, eight, however many innings. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, the my comfortability with that started when I was probably 11 years old. I think it was fifth or sixth grade. Mm-hmm. My uncle, who was visiting from Oklahoma, his older son was a baseball player, played at Texas Tech and transferred to Oklahoma Christian. But he showed me a knuckle curve grip when I was in Little League. He's like, here, just throw this. Don't try and do anything with it. Just let the grip do the work. And I think from that point on, learning that and just being around spin from such an early age with a pitch that wasn't going to do any damage to my arm just Mm -hmm. allowed me to have that feel for for the baseball and spinning the ball. And when it comes down to it, when I'm throwing my pitches, it's all about the feel out of my fingertips. I'm not, not really focused on when it's going good. I'm not focused on what my legs are doing or what my arms are doing. Obviously when I come out of it, I have to recognize that and fix that. But the feel all started back when I was probably 11 years old and just learning how to throw a curveball in and just been spinning the ball since. 
I think that's a resounding theme we've heard from actually a lot of our guests. And I know we, we did like a whole curveball episode with Christian Wonders where we talk about, yeah, yeah. you know, when should kids start with it? But, you know, we just had Tim Collins on. He was a guy who threw it at a young age. I know Adam Ottavino has said like, you know, he would play games when he tried to spin it into buckets. And, you know, the guys weren't trying to make it huge or be really aggressive off the mound, but they always had a passion for trying to manipulate the baseball at a younger age. Um, and I think that's such an important resounding theme. Don't, don't think it's going to blow up an elbow. You gotta, it's like anything else. You gotta practice at a young age if you want it to be elite down the road when you learn that intent and how to organize no your doubt. body. Um, yeah. I mean, the way you throw a football is essentially could be taught as a curveball and that's not detrimental to an arm. So true. It's a great point. You don't see a lot of Tommy Johns in quarterbacks. Correct. Um, so I'm curious. So you were, you alluded earlier to, you know, throwing five slash six pitches. Was that, something that evolved over the course of time in pro ball, or was it something that you, um, you, you basically did all at once in an off season and you just rolled it out. How did, how did the pitch mix evolve over the years? Uh, the pitch that's taken the longest and is still taking some time is the change up. Um, like I said, I had a, a really good feel for spinning the ball from a young age, but I never had the feel for getting the ball to go the other way. Um, but really, Adding, uh, I've tweaked, I've changed my pitches pretty much the end of, from the beginning of 2018 until the beginning of 2019, every single pitch had some kind of tweak to grip or thought behind the ball or how, some kind of change with, uh, whether it was small or big. Um, for my two seam, I, it was pretty inconsistent. Um, some would take off, some would stay straight, some would cut. Uh, and I just, I found a grip that, I I know I spin the ball, so I eventually found a grip. It's more of a one seam spin, mm-hmm. not the not the same action that Trinan gets, but uh, <laughs> definitely the, for my arm slot and for the way I throw the ball, kind of being on the side of it, uh, I found a, a grip that the more I spin it, the more efficient it is, and the the better the action is. It's interesting, and that that consistency with that pitch kind of took off. But the, this I, I mentioned earlier, all my breaking stuff was blending and it pretty much came down to a conversation in 2018 in the dugout with Ruben. I know I mentioned Ruben earlier already, but Ruben and I, and I know he pretty much helped Corey develop his two seam way back in the day. Ruben's the man. I'm a big but, fan. I bet he's a listener yeah. too. So hello Ruben. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. What's up Rube? Um, but yeah, we just sat down during a game. He's like, Hey, where, where are your pitches at right now? And where do you want them to be? And we just kind of went through the way I like describing my pitches, at least on paper, is just as simple as what a video game shows, the arrows and the direction that how many arrows is break and the direction is the direction that the ball's going. We just kind of sat down and drew where my stuff was and below along with those and tried to decide where we wanted them to be. Mm-hmm. And we took that and created a game plan and just rolled with it. I know my cutter at the time was more of a slider. It was probably 83 to 85 instead of where we wanted it was 86 to 89, mm-hmm. ideally. And went out and threw a bullpen the next day and just really focused on that. And then I'm pretty sure the next game I was 86 to 89, some nineties. And a lot of that one was easier just cause that's a uh, straightening that out was uh, just an easier feel for me. And that's still my, my best pitch and my, my easiest pitch feel wise. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had a time in 2018 where I had lost my cutter, so I was pretty much out of whack with everything. That might have been where everything else spiraled and started combining. Um, but just creating a game plan. And, you know, we mentioned Christian earlier with my slider. I, I asked him last off season what he shows guys for two seam grips just to try and get some more consistency with that and see if I could feel something else that would work better. He showed me a two seam grip and I threw it to McAvoy and it, it was a slider. I was like, Oh, well, that's not a two seam. That's a slider, but I'll, I'll call a slider this time and throw it and through that. And it's kind of that two seam grip that a lot of guys throw. Um, and just for whatever reason is works as a good slider. That's wild. And I, the thing that I think is interesting, like just looking at your 2019 numbers. So you, you were 38 and a half percent fastballs, which was basically a combination of two seams and four seams. You were 15, yes. 15% sliders, 29% cutters, 11% curveballs, and 6.5% changeups. So you basically have six pitches in big league games, but 
you know, there's a, a wide variety of usage. Like it's hard for a hitter to just sit on everything. And do you think that when you combine that, you know, basically variability in terms of your pitch mix with your ability to consistently throw strikes with pretty much all of them, is it just that you can be more successful in those, those traditional hitting counts? Like you don't have a problem throwing anything and, you know, two Oh three one, anything like that. And so they can't sit on stuff. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I, I can't do that without knowing what my pitches are going to do. And yeah. it, it, what, figuring that out was the biggest thing for me, just so I can go in with the game plan. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't have the catcher call the game if he doesn't know which pitch is, yeah. pitch is going to be. I, in my head in the past, it was catcher puts down a slider. I throw a slider. In my head, I threw a slider, but it was actually a curveball. Mm -hmm. So I, I wasn't processing that. Um, being aware of that and getting all my pitches to – be individual pitches uh, definitely helped with all of that and being comfortable throwing them at any point. You've, you've mentioned, you alluded to it earlier and I was going to ask this anyway, so it's a good segue to it. You alluded to pitches blending. Um, so I think there's, there's three big things that, that jump out at me, right? There's, there's a two seam and a four seam, which we both know, like from a spin axis standpoint are usually going to be markedly different, right? As a right-handed pitcher, usually you're going to see like a, 12 to one spin axis on a four seam and a two to three on a two seam. So like Mike Soroka is one of our guys. Mike differentiates those two things really, really well. So that's the first thing. The second one is, you know, the curveball and the slider, do they become the same thing? And then there's the slider and the cutter. How do those two separate up each other? So let's talk about the fastball first. Like, do you have a different mentality when you throw a two seam for a four seam? Um, like, are they, are they differentiated in your brain in terms of how you approach them? Yeah, absolutely. And the four seam was something that I worked on all off season. I had Indians send out a Edutronic and worked with the Rap Soda with Kyle and mm -hmm. Kevin up in, in Mass. Um, the two seam for me is whether you call it a two seam or a sinker. Um, that's just my, my pitch where I can throw it with as much intent as I need to mm -hmm. and just let the action play. The four seam is something like I mentioned before when I first started throwing it was a baby cutter mm -hmm. and that was an issue that I still had. The spin access was not ideal and it, it was okay. It was a decent pitch. Um, but just consistency with it was not great. My feel for it wasn't great. I felt like I had to control what was happening instead of just gripping it and letting it rip. Are you a guy that feels um, way better with a, I mean, have you always felt you could command a two seam better than a four seam? Cause I know that was, that was a Kluber, you know, discovery. That was a, a major yeah. aha career moment. Uh, with, with this most recent change to my two seam grip. Yeah. Since the end of 2018, mm -hmm. I definitely have way more comfortability with the two seam than the okay. four seam. Um, which is why I put a lot of effort this off season into the four seam, trying mm -hmm. to figure out how to have feel with that. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll yet to see how, how that plays out, uh -huh. but between those two, definitely two seam more comfortable. And even mm -hmm. data wise, I know my two seam, Average velo is a little higher than my four yep. seam, which is not always the case. Typically, not the case. Is that um, yeah. you know, do you think it's just a comfort level thing? Like you're you're comfortable just like powering late arm speed with it, um, because you're not trying to manipulate it, or is it just that there's you know, happenstance? You don't even know why it's the case. Um, yeah, I mean, I know I know what the spin access and the spin efficiency is on the four seam, and yep. in the past it was not great, so. Being able to just get up there and throw it is was not always the case when I knew if I got up there and threw my two seam, I pretty much knew where it was going to go. Mm -hmm. um, knowing where I can miss with the four seam is just not not there yet, comfort level wise. I, I know certain spots where my two seam plays, and I know where it can miss and not get hurt there. So definitely a comfort level with those. Is there a certain cue for each one of those pitches that you know is a resounding theme for you that you're telling yourself as you're going to throw one of them? The four seam is still, like I said, work in progress. Yeah. Um, I throw out of that, what was it 30, 30 something percent fastballs? 30, 38.5%. Yeah, that's probably three to five percent four seams, if yeah. that. Um, but just comfort level with the two seam is, is there. Probably two seam and cutter are both equally comfortable pitches with for me. And fortunately, they play together very well. Absolutely. What about the curveball versus the slider? Um, cause you see, obviously, if you have two breaking balls in Major League Baseball right now, you know, you saw obviously with Scherzer, Trevor Bauer is a guy who, who made a big difference with his career when he had both. Like, who are, you know, 
what are some of the things that you tell yourself to differentiate those two? Because the curveball has always been good. The slider obviously is a little bit newer. Yeah. So the original slider that I threw, the accidental one from college, I ended up blending with my curveball. Um, it was probably in that 79 to 81 range. My curveball is somewhere in the 75 to 79 range. Mm-hmm. Um, but the original curveball I threw growing up uh, was a knuckle curve, and I, I got away from that. And I switched it back to a, a soft spike at the end of 2018. Uh, just my right finger as just the finger pad on the ball. Um, move the grip around a little bit and just got to move some position up on the ball a little bit to avoid it from popping out of the hand. Um Got a lot more comfortable throwing that up and down and getting it to bounce behind the plate. Whereas the slider in the past was a bigger pitch. It was probably more of a slurve than a slider, um, which is why they ended up blending so much. Um, but that accidental grip I found last year uh, and continue to work throughout the whole year was kind of where I wanted it to. I I never got back up sliders in the past, but last year I did and mm-hmm. When it, sometimes it's effective, but Mm -hmm. when it, when it went well, it was what I wanted it to. It was probably 82 to 84, sometimes 85, somewhere in that range, just a little late action slider, uh, to play with two seam cutter change up that mix. That's awesome. What about the slider versus the cutter? Um, cause that's something that, you know, guys struggle with, have struggled with for, for generations. It seems like they become the exact same thing, whether it's because the cutter isn't hard enough or the slider is too hard. Yeah. So a lot of sliders and now could be, and today's game could be classified as cutters or just like the hard slider is a cutter that's tilted at a different angle or depending on where it's thrown in the zone. I'm sure a lot of guys that if they threw their slider up in the zone, it would be considered a cutter, but a big thing for me was like grip association. My slider and my cutter in the past were pretty much the same grip, just a little bit tilted. Mm-hmm. And changing those two grips allowed me to differentiate the two in my mind and then physically differentiate the two. And for me, my cutter is more of just a, a four seam that's going towards home plate, but spinning as if I was throwing it towards maybe the first base on deck circle. Okay. That's the that's the direction I want it spinning. That's how it comes out of my hand, but I'm throwing it with the direction towards home plate, obviously. Mm-hmm. And I've found just certain locations where I know I can throw it where it where it won't get hurt. Um and I know where where it does get hit pretty hard and um uh, but figuring out those two things, a lot of a lot of things that have helped me are just one, figuring out what my pitches are going to do. And once I do that, finding areas where I know they will work and areas that won't work. And the, the more I can avoid those misses and areas that don't work, are the, the better off I'll be. I'm, I'm curious. So um, we even joked about this. but So Mark Trumbo, um, who I helped out with <laughs> last year and got to know pretty well, you faced Mark on um, one of his rehab stints in the minor leagues. He, he wound up hitting a homer on you. And I, I sent him a text after the game. I was like, man, I'm glad you're hitting tanks in the minor leagues, but can you try not to do it off our guys? And <laughs> he's like, I wouldn't worry about him. That guy's going to stick in MLB for a long time. Um, and sure enough, you were in the big leagues, I want to say, a month later. Um, and, and obviously had a, had a really smooth start to your career, you know, set records. I think it was, you know, 10 starts with a, you know, an ERA of, uh, what was it about? It was like a two, three ERA of your first 10 major league starts. And, you know, they weren't just like, uh, Steelers, like you went out there and you ate a lot of innings um, in each outing. So I'm, I'm curious, what what was it that you think makes a guy as as tenured as Trumbo recognize that you're a guy that's going to have big league success when he sees you in Double A? What are the things that stand out about you that made you a, a successful big league pitcher from the day you got there? Yeah, so <laughs> I think that was the second time I saw him. I actually faced him in Bowie the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my first five starts in. In Akron last year was was in Bowie and he was rehabbing in Bowie and then I believe one of my starts up in Columbus we played Norfolk and sure enough he was in the lineup and he go. just ambushed a fastball I just threw middle middle I think he was the second batter of the game and he hit it dead center he got it uh, he he hit it pretty good I know <laughs> the ball can fly in Columbus but he definitely hit that good. <laughs> um, what separates for me honestly is just I he hit that home run but. 
it, it didn't affect the rest of the game. Um, I'm pretty sure I came back later in the game and got him on a glove side fastball he took for strike three. Um, <laughs> it's, it's more, for me, it's not result based. Um, I go in knowing all the work I put in going into the game and each and every day to prepare for what I'm going out there to do. And if I'm looking at the results, I'm at the end of the day, I'm probably either going to be too high on the highs or too low on the lows. And that's no way to live this game or life in general. Um, Mm -hmm. Just knowing all the preparation and everything that goes into it's too, too high emotionally to look at the results and, just going out there and competing and once the ball leaves my hand I can't control it I can just to the best of my ability control what it, what's happening until that happens um, I'm going to make mistakes there's going to be hits there's going to be errors there's going to be home runs there's going to be strikeouts but just uh, knowing everything that's going on and being aware of everything that could happen makes everything that does happen easier separating bad processes from bad outcomes right absolutely Nice. Um, so you did have a, a, a last train in double A a couple of years ago and, um, we, we connected you with Eric Schoenberg. Um, so I knew you and Eric became good friends. You got to appreciate, I feel like both of you guys have a good dry wit that people probably don't appreciate <laughs> until they get to know you. So you became a raving fan of Eric's and I'm, I'm curious, what was it, you know, we have a lot of physical therapists, training edition coaches who listen to these podcasts. What was it about rehabbing with Eric that for you was so impactful? Cause I know you guys stay in touch and talk often. Yeah. Um, first of all, it's just the, the comfortability, the way that he paid attention to what I was saying and mm-hmm. took into account everything that was going on. It wasn't just here, come in, you're going to do this and then you're going to leave. It was, a uh, we pretty much built a relationship from the beginning. Um, just at the end of the day, it was attention to detail, all the little things that making sure that I was, I was in there rehabbing my lap, but we were making sure that everything was in order. Um, mm-hmm. pretty much restarted routine from the ground up. Um, mm-hmm. and I still do most of the stuff yep. that we established to this day. I did a lot of it throughout all of the year last year and continue to refine that for what I need at the time. And there's a lot of things that are daily things that I go through. And that's all thanks to what we, we went through. And it was a we, it wasn't just a him telling me what to do. Um, yeah. It, it does take a, a part uh, of the player, whoever is into doing that rehab, um, to be aware of what's going on and ask questions and be sure that what they're doing is going to be beneficial or or whatnot. But a lot of it was just finding ways that there could you could limit the the wasted movement. If you're doing something with your arm, how can you incorporate the lower half? If you're doing something for your lower half, how can you incorporate the core or or whatnot, just to kind of lock down those patterns that you're going to use once you're out there on the mound. Because at the end of the day, the, the goal is to be on the mound and do that for as long and as efficiently as possible. I always tell guys, don't just rehab, get educated. Like, you know, when you leave, you know, a PT clinic after, you know, eight weeks or whatever it is that you do, you should, you should actually feel like you can speak the language and be like a physical therapy assistant if you had to with somebody who had the same injury as you, you know? 100%. Yeah. You should know if you're doing it and you know what's going on, you're going to be that much more committed to it. If you're just doing it because someone tells you to, there's, there's no way you can be that bought in. Um, you can be bought into getting better, but if you know what's going on and why you're doing something and what's happening because of it, then it's a lot easier to, to put all the work in. Nice. So let, let's shift gears a little bit and we're going to talk about your five day routine. Um, so, you know, I know you even commented that it's still a work in progress. You're sorting it out and obviously you have more resources at your fingertips on the big league side than you would have in a double A or even lower level. So, um, you've got great people there and, you know, and Joe and James and some of the other crew in, in, in Cleveland, but let's yeah. talk about your five day rotation. Uh, so what does it look like from a throwing standpoint for you? Which so, day do you want to start with? So start go, day or day, day after? Day, so let's say, uh, let's say you've made a start. And we'll come back and we'll talk about that. But so that's day zero. What are you doing on day one, two, three, four, throwing wise? Okay. Throwing wise, uh, last year I did just weighted balls day after. Mm-hmm. Um, pretty much the same routine I would do pre throw for any other day. Uh, maybe a few more throws on the back end. Mm-hmm. Um, but no baseball touching. One, to just give my arm a little bit more of a rest. And two, the way the seams are nowadays, just giving my fingertips a break. I know I've had some blister issues in the past, so uh, point. Touch, 
touching those laces every day might not be the most beneficial thing and still getting a lot of good work out of uh, weighted balls. Okay, so day two, what's happening? Day two, throwing-wise, would just be out to 90 feet. Um, pretty lighter, pretty much a lighter day, uh, and that kind of coincides with weight room-wise. Um, yep. More of a, a lower day recovery type. Get ready for – actually, I threw the bullpen on the third day, so I know a lot of guys – do the second day and third day was something I did last year. Just a discussion I had with one of the rehab coordinators and spring training and we tried it out and I, I liked it. That's mm-hmm. still, that's one of the things trying to figure out if we want to keep doing that. Yeah. Um, but that was just to give me some more recovery on the front end and challenge me to not overdo it in the bullpen, which yep. is definitely a problem for me in the past. Okay. And then, so bullpen and then what about day four? Um, well, yeah, bullpen day, I would get out to distance wise, just around probably 150 to 180. Mm-hmm. Um, my long toss days would be my mound days. Okay. As far as extending during the season. Um, yeah, bullpen, I would ideally try and keep it to 25 to 35 pitches. Obviously go over that because that's just what pitchers do. Um, <laughs> but yeah, day four back to 90 feet, just, uh, maybe quick light flat ground at the end, spin some stuff and get a feel for pitches and make sure you're in a good spot for the start the next day. I like it. All right. Now let's talk about how the actual, like, uh, you know, lifting, sprinting, recovery stuff, uh, happens over the course of those days. So what's, what's going on the day after you pitch? You obviously are yeah. playing a little, or you're just doing the lot, the weighted ball stuff with, um, you know, non-baseball activity, but what about the, the actual weight room stuff? Yeah. Weight room would be a full, full body lift day after, mm-hmm. um, typically do all the throwing and running before mm-hmm. and then hop in the weight room after that. Um, that changes throughout the year what the actual lift is, but yep. full, full body lift day after, um, more of a longer, longer, maybe three quarter pole or half pole distance type running. Um, every, every once in a while I'll try and get off get off our feet and do some elliptical or bike stuff just yep. to give the knees some break. Um, another recovery thing I do day after, um, just with the access and the ability to do it, we have a team masseuse. So I get a massage yep. day after, uh, yep. after every start. Absolutely. And I'll do a pretty much heavy, deep tissue, tissue massage every other. I can, I can handle it every five days, <laughs> but, but, uh, get in there every probably 10th day and, the other bi-weekly would just be kind of a flush. Um, okay. Obviously, any individual thing, maybe some more attention on that. But mm-hmm. What about the day two? Is Because I know you're throwing a day three pen, and you've gotten out yeah. pretty good in the weight room, so I'm curious what day two looks like. Day two is, a, like I said, with throwing pretty light. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of whatever, if something's barking more that week, maybe put some more attention to that in the training room. Um mm-hmm. I like to do some grass and stuff. I think, I think the day after, so this day two, I'm pretty sure I did cupping stuff on my lower back just to keep mm-hmm. that loosened up. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of plane rides, a lot of sitting around. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you got to watch the whole game. So there's a lot of sitting during that when you're not, when you're not pitching. Um, there's some, some attention to things that are not necessarily my arm that day, just making sure the body as a whole is prepped and ready for the next day. Cause day three is such a big day for me last year. It can a bullpen and a lift and, uh, whatever conditioning that day. I'm pretty sure day three conditioning was gas or stuff. So it was a definitely a very high intensity day. Mm-hmm. Um, always challenging to, get the working in the bullpen, but not overdo it. That's something I struggled with in the past. I'd always been a, just that reliever in me was just, once you're on the mound, it's go, go, go. Um, figuring out how to get on the mound and be efficient with your work, but not overdo it was, was, and is a challenge, but it's definitely, I, I think moving to that third day helped my body recover yeah. from, the full, ideally you're throwing close to a hundred, if not more pitches on your yeah. start day. Um, didn't make sense really to just take one day off and then throw a bullpen mm-hmm. and then have two days to recover from a bullpen, but just making sure that everything is ready for that bullpen and then you're not overdoing it then. So you're, I, 
the goal is to be ready every fifth day and not, not for your bullpen. Well, I think the other thing too, is you think about it, if you're, you're going to go out and get after it in the start and the next day, that's your, you know, most intensive training day, you know, it's a full body lift, it's doing some sprint yeah. stuff. And then if your bullpen's the next day, you've, you basically had high, high, and you haven't had a low before you try to get your quality skill work in Correct. But without even realizing that you kind of just described a really good high, low model of day zero yeah. to one is pretty aggressive. Day two is more mellow and day three, it ramps back up. And then you have day four to kind of pick up whatever pieces you need to pick up before you're, you're fresh again on day five. So I, yeah, I, exactly. I, I'm not allowed to like necessarily play favorites because I never like to influence guys' decisions, but I'm a fan of the day <laughs> three pen. And I know a lot of other people that are, you know, Alan Jager has always been a big advocate for day three pens as well. And I, I just think you can get a lot of quality work in because it's not so acute right after the start, but you also kind of shorten the learning loop, right? If you, if you want to ride a bike, you know, and you're a, you know, a, a seven year old who's trying to learn, you know, if you're, if you're at like a bike contest on, you know, day five, wouldn't you rather have like practice on day three instead of day two, just so it's a little bit fresher yeah. in your mind, kind of shorten that learning group. That so, too. Yeah. Just what, take what you throw or work on in the bullpen into the game. Yeah. I, never, I haven't thought about it that way. There's a lot of guys that like to just throw like, I mean, I, I know Kluber for, for a long time would, you know, be 10 pitches off the mound bef- the day before a start just to have some feel for yeah. it. Um, yeah. So a little short box. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, uh, let's talk about the actual day of a game though, right? So how does it play out for you from the time you get to the park and what you're going through routine wise before you make that start? Yeah, that's, uh, definitely a work in progress for me. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a big eater on day games. I don't okay. just, whatever my stomach is, is it's, it's hard for me to get food down sometimes. <laughs> um, that's something I'll have to find something that I'm always in the mood for, um, <laughs> and get me just get that in. Uh, mm-hmm. whether it's a breakfast or a lunch or a sandwich or, or whatnot. Um, when that's the case, I try and go in and either make a smoothie or try and figure something out that way to get the nutrients in that I need. Mm-hmm. But if the game's at seven, say seven o'clock to make it easier for number wise, probably get to the field around two ish. Um, I like to get there early just to one, not be in my own head, but just be around the environment and get, yep. get ready for, for the game. Um, typically whatever notes we have on the guys and the other, the other lineup, if they have the lineup submitted, um, will be in our, our lockers. Mm-hmm. So we'll get going on prep with that. Um, we have all the video access we need and all the, all the data we have with uh, what the guys do in the front office is great. And just get in there and come up with a game plan. I like to look back at video from not only my previous start, but other pitchers starts that have recently faced the lineup that I'm about to face and try and pick out certain pitches or sequences that are similar to mine and see how, how the hitters are reacting. Obviously my game plan can change every day. So, so can hitters, um, they make adjustments. That's why they're up here. It's just who, who can make the adjustment first and who can make it more efficiently. Um, but a lot, I'll probably get in the tubs, uh, pretty early just to get the body warmed up and loosen out. And as far as start time for prep work, um, the game's at seven, I'll probably get going around five, um, roll out, whatever I got to do that. Um, around five thirty, five forty five, I'll get in the training room, get everything I need done with them. All pre stuff. Um, <laughs> bunch of little things so i don't i won't explain everything might take too long (laughs) it's all good (laughs) but after that i'll probably get get back in the weight room and go through some med ball routines um all my pre-throw stuff at this point got a pretty good pretty good sweat going on nothing crazy but heart rate's definitely going um and i'll get all weighted ball stuff and med ball stuff all that in inside and probably head out around the game's at seven, probably head around 6.35 ish. Um, start playing catch around 6.35 to 6.40, somewhere in there. Uh, get on the mound, have about 10 minutes on the mound, uh, depending on the day with home or away. Mm-hmm. At home, usually get back in the dugout before the anthem um, on the road, or if not before the anthem, right, right after. It depends. Some, some cities do the anthem right before the game. Some do it 15 minutes before the game. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think at home, I typically get most of my pen in right before the anthem and then throw one or two more and then walk in, uh, have 
few minutes in the dugout just to cool down before I head out there on the road. I might wait a little bit longer just to decrease that in between time. Yeah. What's your, uh, what's your, do you have like a actual sequence that you go through in the bullpen? Like exactly how many pitches that you'll throw of each type? Not to an exact science, but I pretty much work the same, uh, same routine within a few pitches. Um, start out with arm side fastballs and then work change ups off that. Mm-hmm. Once I feel comfortable with those, probably five or six, maybe, maybe a few more, maybe a few less, depending on the day. Mm-hmm. I'll move to glove side, uh, Fastballs, work some cutters off that, and then work some change-ups and sliders over there. And I'll move back to, at this point, pro, those are probably all out of the wind-up. Um, maybe after 10 or so, 10, 12 pitches, I'll go to the stretch. I'll go back to arm side, two seams, and work that with sliders and change-ups on arm side. Um, just working on location and where I, where I know I can miss and try and get to the spots where I know I'm not going to get hurt too badly um and then from there i'll whatever if some i need to work on something a little more i'll I'll do that if not i'll switch over to working on some four seams up and down and some curveballs to play off that um having five pitches i know sequence wise makes for long bullpens doesn't it (laughs) yeah it can definitely make for some long bullpens especially if one or two are not on that day and you're trying to get them back. Um, I mean, it happens. I tell them, okay, let me know I'm at 25. All right. I'm at 25. And then I finish my bullpen at 36, but, uh, just trying to find pitches and sequences that play together and working on something that I may work on throughout the game instead of just throwing pitches to feel them. If I'm not feeling my slider that day, I may throw another pitch that's going to help me feel that action with the slider better if i'm not driving the slider i may need to drive a fastball before i throw a slider if i'm yanking my curveball i may need to drive a pitch before that to get the curveball feel the arm the feel that i need to with my arm and hand to to get that shape and feel with the curveball that i'm looking for that's awesome and I, so I'm, I'm actually really intrigued ask so we always do a lightning round so you've you probably heard a couple of these because you've listened to it but um the one I'm actually really intrigued to hear is what pitchers do you like to watch and why? You know, like when you throw this many pitches, I have to assume you can try to model your game after, you know, 150 different pitchers in baseball, depending on what they do. So who do you really like to see? Um, yeah, I like to take bits and pieces from guys, like you said, but growing up, definitely the way that Pedro competed yeah. was definitely, I mean, I grew up a Red Sox fan, so yeah. uh, watching him and do what he did and, Obviously, don't throw arm slot wise or velo wise anything like he did, but just the way he approached the game, um, he definitely never backed down, and he definitely attacked the, the hitters as if he was on offense and not them. Um, he was definitely fun to watch, and I know. I think back in 2014, I was in freshman summer league in Worcester. I don't know if it was the first time I'd seen him throw, but I remember watching Tanner Roark throw and I was like, Hey, that guy kind of throws pretty similar to me. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, after last year, one of my player comps from a stuff perspective is Roark. So that's awesome. he's definitely a guy that he doesn't have necessarily electric stuff, but he knows how to, how to use it and he, he attacks with it well. And, and I know it's unfortunate, but he's, I don't know, 93, 95, and that's not considered electric anymore, but. Uh, he's always smiling and he's got a great beard. So and Tanner's a great, <laughs> great dude. So yeah, I'm definitely cool not always smiling when I'm on the field, <laughs> but I'll, I'll try and keep the beard uh, up to standard as often go. as I can. <laughs> that's a good cop though. Um, so actually I'm also curious, like if you could go back and give yourself advice, what would you tell a uh, teenage Aaron? Uh, figure out what the weight room is and take care of your shoulder. <laughs> there you go. All right. What about favorite teammate of all time and why? Ooh. This can be any I level. A, you can pick yeah. multiple if you want to. Definitely had a lot of teammates. Um, hmm. High school. I mean, my catcher in high school is Nick Maselli. He's playing. He plays. He's played in Australia. He's played in Germany. He still plays baseball every once oh, in a while. Nice. I went to went to Wesleyan. Um, mm-hmm. Just a, I've always had a good relationship with catchers. Um, 
I moved to next one. My roommate in summer ball in the Cape was Jake Rogers. He's with the Twins now or the Tigers now. Um, so I I see him pretty frequently throughout the year. Um, he's just good roommate, good dude. I had, had a good relationship with him. Um, I don't know. I've always bonded with the catchers, which is what you want as a pitcher, I guess. And you uh, they they know pitchers better than all the other position players do. That's for sure. That's a good one. I feel like Mike King talked about that too when we had him on. So great minds think alike, I think. <laughs> yeah. um, well, awesome, man. This was fantastic. I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, folks can find you on Twitter and Instagram. It's Aaron Savale or at Aaron Savale on both of those, correct? Yeah. Awesome. Well, we wish you very, very well this year. We're excited to see you build on a, on a really good rookie campaign last year. So thanks again for taking the time. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd be thrilled if you'd consider subscribing to the podcast and leaving us a review to read on iTunes. We welcome your suggestions for future guests and questions. Just email EliteBaseballPodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for your continued support, and we'll see you next episode.